So, this is firepower. Now, my sermon on Pentecost last year was also called Firepower, so I had to update this one. This is 2018. It's not the same sermon. But it's the same principle, and that is God has given us firepower. Now, at our church over the last four weeks, we went through this study of Scripture. We were seeing how God has called us. Now that he's risen from the dead, he's called us to be partners with him. He calls it the new covenant, right? This is the church word for it, but the real world is a partner where we participate together in a common goal. He set us free with a new purpose. And our purpose, we asked, why were you born? You were born because God loves you. He created you in love. And then he's inviting you to come alongside him. And then we said we've been given power, in this case, firepower, to do the job with him, to participate, to go with him and to do stuff, to Guys, to make a difference in the things that matter most in this world. And then last week we said part of that process, part of all what that looks like, is the creation of a new people. Not just, you know, a nice little thing that you do, sort of a diversion from all your Netflix binging or whatever, um, but actually something that happens in the real world, right? And so it's something that goes on. And so this is what we're talking about with firepower, which is this idea of the Spirit comes. He comes to you and He comes to me. And he sets us free. That's why the very first verse was, it is for freedom, Christ has set us free. He sets us free to join him, to participate with him, to do stuff, right? And so the question then is, what is our firepower, right? And so what is, what is this thing? What are these things that we have to do, that we have in our, in our arsenal to participate with him? Take a look at Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We're going to put these on the screen, and we're going to zoom in on some key words because... The first thing we need to see is that what happened on the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of the prophecy we see in Joel chapter 2. When Joel, by the power of the Holy Spirit back in those days, said, there's going to be this great and terrible day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Or as my professor, Dr. Reed Lessing, would often say, the Yom Yahweh. You know, he he would actually say it in that type of voice, which was always a little scary. You know, it's a little scary. And it was just this idea of the day of the Lord when when the Lord would come and do stuff, right? And, And it says the great and terrible day. So which makes me think is when they heard that wind, that it was probably a little startling. Probably more than a little. And then when, they, when people saw fire, you know, gather, I mean, if you saw fire on your head, that would, that would be unsettling, right? It would be a pretty terrible event. And yet, after it's over and they've experienced this, just the power of God, then what, what Peter says, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, no, all of this, the stuff that just happened is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2. And then I've just got one phrase from that. He says, in the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, right? And guys, this is not a simple little thing. See, I grew up in the church, so I hear that, and I'm like, okay, great. Everybody gets a spirit, hoorah, you know, whatever. I mean, this is kind of, but no, this is a huge deal because in the Old Testament, we were talking about this in Bible class this morning, in the Old Testament, very few people got the spirit. And we saw that in the Bible Projects video they were showing. There's, you know, you can find them in the story. There's a few people here and there. They get the spirit in order to do a particular task in order to help God bring about the, the coming of the Messiah. So some of them were people like who designed, helped design the temple to show us what God's intention for the world was like, to show us, like it's, show us what it's like to be in his presence. Joseph had these dreams that he was given so that, so that he could somehow find his way into helping run the government of Egypt so that the people, all the people could be fed when the droughts came and the, and the famines came. And then... We see these prophets, one right after another, who just keep saying, there's a dude who's coming. Now, that's a slight paraphrase, but there's a dude who's coming, right? He's going to be the king, the one who saves everyone. And what Peter is saying is in the last days, well, Joel said it first, right? But Peter repeats, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on everybody, not just a few of you who have certain things or certain talents or certain tasks, but on everybody. Now take a look at verse 18. He says, even on my servants, both men and women. Now you've got to understand, for a first century Jew, this was a big deal. It's also probably a big deal for people in 2018. So both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. In those days they might, no, they will prophesy. Now you might be sitting there going, Look, Mark, I'm tracking with you, but if I could prophesy, dude, I'm playing the lottery. That's how it's going to go down. And so I understand that, and I appreciate that, but actually prophesy is something that is a very interesting thing. If you go back and you study all the prophets 
And what they would do when they prophesied, only a small percentage of the time would they foretell the future, which is to say something that's going to happen in the future, but I'm telling you how it's going to go down right now with pretty extreme detail, such as the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. He says, the servant will come and he will stand like a sheep before the slaughter. And it was by his stripes that you and I will be healed. And he proceeds to tell everything that's going to happen to Jesus at the crucifixion. Psalm 22, where it, it talks about how the, they're going to divide his clothes and they're going to cast lots for them and they're going to pierce him in Zechariah chapter 12 and all these different places throughout the Old Testament where there's these powerful prophecies of what's going to go down when the dude gets here. right? But more often than not, eight out of ten times when you open the prophets, they're not going to foretell the future. They're going to foretell God's word. Now, forth telling is something that we all experience on a regular basis because this is saying something that is true, has been true, is now true, and will be true. See, and this has a tremendous impact on the future because when we, what you and I often do is we actually don't live in the present when we need to. You and I often, we tend to either live in the past, dwelling on it, lamenting it, being haunted by it, or we're worried about the future, of what might happen, of what could happen, of what should happen, and of what isn't happening yet. And these are the things we're worried about, right? And we, so we're lamenting, and we're, we're, we have grudges, and, and we have regrets, and then we also have worries, and we have frustrations. When in actually God's word is for here and now. It's here to say, Jesus died for you. Now, that has some pretty important things that influence your past and certainly some important things that influence the future. And it's true right now. You see, when we prophesy, what we say to one another is God loves you. We don't know why these things are happening. I haven't been given the gift of foretelling, but I have the gift of forthtelling. And let me say it to you right now. You have been given the Holy Spirit because God loves you and he saved you and he bought you with his blood the blood of Jesus, the dude who was to come, right? The blood of Jesus that was spilled, that we sang about when we very first began. We said, just as I am, Lord, I got nothing. That's right, we got nothing. And yet you've got everything. That is forth telling. That is prophesying to you what is true. And it influences the past. It defines the present. And it prepares you for the future. So that you can face tomorrow what you do not know is going to happen. But you know who will be with you when it happens. You tracking? You following this? This is, this is prophesied. And this is what we have been set to be. We're fire talkers, right? We're fire talkers because we talk with fire. We talk with spirit by his power to tell the story of what has happened. And yeah, every once in a while, we're going to tell you what's going to happen. Because it's like, um, you know, what happens in my life, I don't know if this happens for you, the devil comes, right? This is one of the things. We don't like to talk about the devil in the 21st century because we're enlightened people, blah, blah, blah. And yet we, look on, we turn on cable news and we're like, yeah, there's no devil. Surely not. not I mean, my goodness. And so, and so, yes, the devil will come and he will come to you and he will say, you're terrible. He will say, I know what you did and I'm going to tell everyone. And yet we can sit there and say, actually, let me tell you a little bit of something about prophecy. Is that, yeah, you, you remind me of my past. I'm going to remind you of your future. See, this is how this works. There will come a day when the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20. And that day is because of the victory that Jesus had on the cross and at the empty tomb and the day that the church was born, the day that the Holy Spirit came upon everyone. Take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 21, and then we'll see how this plays out at the end of Peter's sermon in verse 36. Peter quotes Joel, and he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But what's interesting is he's quoting Joel, and in Joel, the name of the Lord is the name of Yahweh, the divine name of God, right? And then look what he says about Jesus. He says, let all Israel know for certain. This is Peter saying, dude, this is the dude, right? This is who he is. Let all Israel know for certain God has made this Jesus, the one you crucified, both Lord, that is God of all, the sovereign majestic Lord of the universe, right? And Christ, the Messiah, the dude who was to come, the rescuer, the one who saves you and he saves me. You see, 
Peter is prophesying. He's telling us what is true, what has been true, what will always be true. And he's saying this is what is so important about what we do and why the church was born. We have to keep telling the story. Take a look at Galatians 5.1. He says there, you know, Paul's preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit right there. He says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, what's really interesting, he says this. He says, don't, guys, don't go right back and put the chains on. Don't go back and let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. There are two available for our selection. And if you're like me, you sample from them regularly, right? Here are the two kinds of slavery. I want you to imagine a highway, right? And on each side, there's a good, nice, juicy ditch, right? And we've, we've, all, been, we've all seen ditches, and some of us have driven into them and fallen into them. I always say that if Debbie didn't come along in my life, I would have died in one. And so you'd just find me some dude dead in the ditch. It would have been me. And so she saves me but what, you know, on a daily basis by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what happens then is, is this idea of there's a, there's a ditch on each side of the road. And you could swerve the wheel one way, you could swerve the wheel the other way. The goal is the middle road. We'll talk about in a moment. What are the two ditches? So on one side, you have what's called legalism, or this idea of the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots. Some people think that's what God's interested in, right? Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, which is his way of saying, I'm not interested so much in the thou shalts as I am in your heart. What's going on in here? See, but we want to focus on the thou shalts because I can fit those into my box. I can make it work. Hey, I've never cheated on my taxes except that one time in 1988. But, we, you know, I've never, I've never been unfaithful to my wife except when I flipped on the Victoria commercial, Victoria's Secret commercial. Or I've never been, you know, see what I'm saying? We, we play games with that and we try to make it like we're good. See, and that's what Paul's very upset about in Galatians 5. Don't try to say you can save yourself. Don't say that you're a good person. Get out of here. Right? Again, that's a paraphrase. But you see what's going on. He's saying those who, have, those who have relied on their own righteousness, they're the ones who have fallen away from grace. If you think you can do it on your own. So, one ditch is legalism, the thou shalt nots. Now, we're going to find the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots are very useful. They're very helpful. They show us what God's will is. But that's not what he wants us to do to earn his love. He saved us before we were even born. He sent the Holy Spirit to birth the church so that they would tell the story so that at some point your parents or your family or you yourself heard it and was saved. Now there's another ditch. I, I tend, I'm, I'm not so much in the thou shalt. I'll go over there sometimes, but boy, oh boy, I like the other ditch. It gets nice and bumpy and I live, I live there a lot. This is the I like to sin, God likes to forgive. This is going to work out great ditch. You follow me there. And so this is, this is, you know, the big fancy word is antinomianism, which is the, where you say there, it doesn't matter. Everything's forgiven. Let's party, right? Which I'm not saying we can't party, but at the same time, there is an irresponsibility. And quite frankly, it goes right back to what Jesus said. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What's going on in your heart? If you think God doesn't care about right and wrong, if you think you can just live your life for yourself, that doesn't make sense. You've been set free. Free. Why would you go back and put the chains on and be burdened by a slavery of saying, how do, I, how do I distract myself? How do I pleasure myself? How do I you know, fulfill all the things I want? If you hear yourself say these words from time to time, when do I get to be happy? This is a yoke of slavery. And you want to be mindful of it. You want to be aware of it. Because that's not freedom. Freedom is a very different kind of thing. The freedom is actually when you start to think, when does she get to be happy? What about him and her? When do they get to be happy? And when your heart starts going to that place, you will find the shackles falling off because this is what God has set us free to do. Take a look at Galatians 5, verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. This is the middle of the road. This is where we live. The thou shalt and the thou shalt nots teach us what it means to love our neighbor. And we don't have to do them to earn God's love, but we do, we do look at them and say, this is what it means to be a good, this is what it means to love. And on the other side, he says, do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. I think there was some hit song, Love the One You're With. I think they might have had something going there, right? I don't know. But anyway, you see how the concept plays out, and this becomes our firepower. See how it works, Galatians 5, to 23. And it's really interesting because it says the fruit of the Spirit. Now, how often do you think of yourself as, 
or how often do you think of, I need to work on the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, Mark, you know, that's really good stuff there. I need to work on that. But it's not the fruit of Mark's efforts or of anybody else's efforts other than one guy, the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said the true worshipers worship in truth and in spirit. Okay? These are the, these are the worshipers my Father seeks. Truth and spirit. And so spirit and truth. And this is exactly what's going on. The truth is this is the fruit of the Spirit in you. Love. So it's very interesting that when we talk about Pentecost, and I was making a joke about becoming a Pentecostal, that sometimes we, we get really zoomed in on the speaking in tongues aspect or the prophesying aspect or all of these things. But what's interesting about love and being the fruit of the Spirit is it's just like what happens in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, you know, you could speak in tongues of angels. If you don't have love, you're a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, he says, if you could prophesy all the majesty and the mysteries of the universe, but you don't have love, you're nothing, right? This is, this is the fruit of the Spirit. He produces in you and me love. And he, he gives us joy while it happens. He, he, he gives us peace so that we can join him and participate with him. Because remember, peace is not just absence of conflict, but restoration. Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. Right? That's, that's what we always say. Um, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, it's really interesting, this idea of faithfulness, because we can sit here and say we, we kind of know what patience is. At least I know what I would really like it to be. Right? I, I, from time to time, I'm kind. I can see the Spirit working in me that way. And goodness is not necessarily my behavior, but what's going on in my heart, right, that produces some decent behavior from time to time. What about this idea of faithfulness? Though? This is an interesting word to say, God, I'm going with you. And, yeah, I might be in a situation that I'm not enjoying. I might be in a, in a relationship that I don't think I should be in. But faithfulness means that I'm going to follow you no matter what. I'm going to serve you no matter what. I'm going to go with you no matter what. I need the Spirit to produce that in me. I don't know if you do as well. And then this idea of gentleness. See, gentleness is, is hard because, especially for some of the fellas in the room, and I'm, I'm one of them, we were taught, you've got to be a man. And I was like, you know, I mean, that's what we do. You know, that's what, you're right? and, then you, and, then it, and then this phrase gets added to it, by God, right? Is that really by God? I don't know. And so I'm about to destroy the Bible, sorry. And so, and so what we do is we have, these, we have this idea of gentleness being from God Almighty, the Most High. His Spirit dwells in us and produces, even in us fellas, this idea of gentleness. And gentleness doesn't mean like wimpy. This is very important. You can be very strong and be very gentle. And that's true of both men and women, right? Right? See, that's right. And so, so trust me, I want Debbie to be gentle to me. If not, I'm just going to get blown away. You'll see my head rolling down the hill. And so the last part is self-control, right? And I, I remember hearing as a kid, you know, self-control is the hardest one. I'm like, no, it's not for the Spirit. We just tend to not allow the Spirit to work. We tend to reject Him. And the question then becomes, if, we're gonna, if, we, want to, if we want to cultivate His fruit in our lives, how do we do this? Take a look at verse 25. Now, I had the urge to just put this whole passage up in Greek because that's what it was written in by Paul um, or by his, his writer that wrote for him. Um, but let's just define the words. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And I think we all know what that means. Now, what's interesting is, he's, is, is let's think about this. So the Spirit of God gives us life. Life everlasting. Life that will live beyond the broken world and will be present to resurrect our bodies in the new world as it's renewed from the old one, right? This is, we live by the Spirit. That's already done. Now, what are we going to do about it? And how do we join him in this? And the answer is keep in step. Now, that Greek word is stoikeo. And stoikeo means to march in formation with. It means to, it's like it would, it, the word in Paul's time would have been you'd have these Roman legions and they would march in step. So it's a military term. And so, and so um, when you march in step, you're in formation with, you have, to, you have to plan that out. And I don't mean plan that out, that's not the right words. You have to, but you have to say, this is what I'm going to do. It's a choice. It's a participation with. So how does this work for you and for me? 
So I get up in the morning, and the first things out of my mouth ought to be, Lord, help me. Help me participate with the Spirit. Pour, pour, pour Him into my heart, and then help me go with Him. Holy Spirit, help me do this. Lord, produce in me a loving heart. Produce in me a joyous heart. As you go through your day, and that person cuts you off in traffic, and you begin to shake your fist, right? Or maybe to give them some sort of salute with a particular finger, and, and all of that sort of wells up in your heart, and say, Lord, give me peace. Forgive me for the fact that I wanted to do that. Lord, you know, we always joke, give me patience and give it to me right now, but Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. And smile about that when you pray it, right? Because I don't have it, and that's why I need it. Produce it in me. Make me a kind person. Because, Lord, I know if I'm kind to my wife, to my children, to my coworkers, to my fellow students, to everyone around me, I know that will influence the world. That your light will be shining into their hearts. That if I could be somehow a person who is, who is good, not good in terms of my behavior and my goody-goody, but good in terms of when the chips are down and I don't know what to do, I call out to Jesus and he helps me. Make me faithful. Faithful to my friends, to my wife, to my husband, to the person I wish would become my wife or my husband or whatever. Help me be faithful to my job. To Maybe I'm retired. Faithful to my neighborhood. Faithful to my church, to, to the people I, I care about. Give me gentleness as I do this. And Lord, when I want to do what I want to do, help me want to do what you want to do. Self-control. Keep in step with the Spirit. Call out to Him every day. He will hear you. Believe this promise. He who hears the words, and believes what they say, has what they promise. Amen. Please pray with me. Father, we ask you to give us this gift today and each day moving forward. And I pray right now, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would remind everyone in this room that we are indeed filled with your Spirit and that you will indeed produce these fruit and that that will indeed be participating with the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.